Okay. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this April 13th, 2021 Cherry Hill Board of Education meeting. Go ahead and read public notice. Public notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act has been given by the board secretary in the following manner. Posting written notice on the official school bulletin board at the administration building on April 7th, 2021. Transmitted notice to the Courier Post and Philadelphia Inquirer on April 7th, 2021. And transmitted notice to the clerk of Cherry Hill Township on April 7th, 2021. Okay, if you will rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United, States, United States of America and to the republic which it stands, one nation, one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty justice, and justice for all. Okay, I will turn it to Mrs. Sugars for roll call. Saborio. Here. Bratton? Here. Ms. Friedel? Here. Mrs. Matlack? Here. Mrs. Abadia? Here. Mrs. Schultz? Here. Ms. Stern? Mrs. Tom? Whoop, you're still muted, Sally. Here. This is Neri. Here. Okay, great. I don't believe, do we have any board recognition this evening, Dr. Malash? Not tonight, Mrs. Neri. And do we have any presentations? I don't see any on the agenda. We do not. Uh, originally, we, uh, we were expecting health proficiency, equity, and character committee to present, uh, but we have moved that back. Um, they're still doing some work that they wanted to have together uh, before they did the presentation. Okay, great. So then that brings us to the administrative reports for the We Return to Learn. Yes. So Dr. Mahan is on with us. Dr. Mahan, let me just pull up the slides. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Mahan. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present again, another update on the We Return to Learn plan. I remind everyone as we do with all of the We Return to Learn plan presentation of our district mission statement, where we have highlighted on the next slide in an ever-changing world to remind us that we are in unprecedented times. And even though it seems like we are at the tail end of the pandemic, we are still dealing with the pandemic, trying to have our students return to school, dealing with political unrest, dealing with civil issues going on in our country. And we need to be mindful of that as we are returning our children back to school. I also remind you of our board strategic goals, which highlight student wellness, purpose and passion, and connecting beyond our classrooms all which are so relevant to the work, again, that we are doing to return to learn and back to our classroom environment. I wanted to take a minute just to highlight on this next slide that our journey continues and the purpose of why we are sharing out. I recognize that there was input from the community, input from board members and teaching staff to highlight the work that the We Return to Learn Committee was participating in and to allow for a more transparent process. But I just wanted to hone in on the fact that these presentations are meant to be informative, 
and reflective of the process of the committee, provide informational updates on where we are, and to communicate what the, what the committee is discussing, which includes multiple voices and multiple perspectives. I have to say, and I have said several times that the members of the Return to Learn Committee are volunteers and members of our teaching community who have dedicated countless hours to the work for a safe return of students and staff to the buildings. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I did not say that after the last meeting, there were some words, I guess, that I had shared in my presentation that were um, not readily accepted by all in the community, but those were words that were used by the committee and shared amongst the committee. And I don't think that the narrative that is being portrayed reflects the work of the committee. So for that, I do just want to thank again, the members of the committee and apologize because at the end of the day, I'm, I am the one who is representing the work of the committee. And I recognize that the individuals who work alongside me don't, don't need that unnecessary scrutiny. So I just wanna remind everyone why we're presenting out and to make sure that the focus is not on necessarily the words, but the focus is on getting all of our students back in school. Another conversation that came out of the last session and has come up numerous times at board meetings and, and in informal conversations includes the percentage of students by level who are in person and remote. So on this slide, you will see that data by elementary, middle and high school level, and then with the grand totals. Additionally, because we were unable to, you know, for sake of all of our eyes, we did not put the data broken down by each school, but it will be posted to the district website after the presentation um, in the come either tonight or tomorrow morning, so that the community as well as everyone on the call tonight can see the breakdown by school in person and remote learning. So as we continue on the road, our next return to learn committee meetings are scheduled for April 20th. I have the times listed here. High school is at 730, elementary at 815, and middle school at 230. Our discussions for the return to learn committees will focus on the following items. There has been a contingency of individuals who are asking for the return to a five day per week in person model that was discussed at the last return to learn meetings. Now we will be talking in regards to a five day return or maintaining the current four day in person model with a restructuring of the Monday schedule at the elementary schools. We have not heard the same push for a return on Mondays at the middle school and high school level. Additionally, we will be surveying the related service providers. One of the reasons why we have shied away from the return on Mondays included um, what was going to be the impact of um, NJSLA testing, which we all now know has been canceled by the New Jersey Department of Education, as well as related service providers who, are, who have been servicing um, students and facilitating meetings on Mondays. So that will be part of the conversation. We will continue the conversation around equity and what are we doing to continue to promote our remote students and make sure that they feel part of the learning community. And again, recognizing that Mondays are the only day that all students receive instruction on the same platform. And then we will start to segue into summer supports and opportunities for students at all levels. Now that we have more guidance on the ESSER II funding, I participated in a technical training this last week and they have clearly outlined the expectations on how those funds can be used, which I will share with the committees. And lastly, we are continuing to plan for September. We are just as eager as everyone else to return to a five day in-person full days of instruction come September of 2021. The remote option, I 
left this on the slide from last month because we need to be mindful that we are still awaiting specific direction from the New Jersey Department of Education and the governor. Many of you may have heard originally, and we have been saying that the remote learning option was tied to the governor's executive order. Last week, the governor, or two weeks ago now, the governor said that um, there will be no remote learning come September. Um, the governor was questioned on that. And now there is going to be additional guidance as he spoke about students who have, um, who are medically fragile and or who need additional supports that would be required in a remote learning environment. So we are still waiting for finalized details on what that will look like as we move forward. And then again, in continuing our plan for September, if we do move forward with the remote option, Elementary students will be grouped by grade, middle by grade and subject, and high school will be grouped by the course. And as always, um, because we want to continue the conversation and be collaborative, um, questions help to support clarity and provide transparency. Feedback helps us to reflect and make things better for the students that we all serve. And then the discussion again helps us to gain, to gain clarity where we are, where we're going, and how we will get there. So, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Malash. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Mahan. Thank you, Dr. Mahan. Did anyone have any questions? Okay. Mr. Avadian does, Ms. Neri. Okay, Mr. Avadia, thank you. Yes, sorry. Um, so yeah, Dr. Mahan, my, my thanks. Um, given that Monday is scheduled to be a town hall, oh, sure, yeah, um, any advice for folks that really wanna, that aren't on the committee, I would imagine, or other committees that wanna delve in, any kind of advice for rules of engagement on, on the Monday town hall? So, I, I didn't hear the full question, Mr. Avadia. So you said in terms of engagement on the town hall for Monday? Yeah, so Monday town hall, I, I believe it will focus on we return to learn. Yes. Um, but I'm just thinking like for folks that have like, you know, for folks that have, what, what kind of things should people, or any, any, any guidance for the community that wants to engage that maybe isn't on the committee for kind of like what Monday might look like or what kind of questions would be best answered in that format, anything like that. I just wanted to sort of put that plug in there slash get your, your opinion. No, I mean, I would just say that if community members, parents have questions, teachers, that they should participate in the town hall and there will be a panel there ready and able to answer any questions, realizing that the town hall is going to be the Monday before we meet, I think that will actually help to inform the conversations that we will be having as a whole. I think it would be premature of us to, or to, you know, slant the conversation for questions that individuals should be asking. We have some generalized topics that we do plan to discuss during the return to learn committee that have been on the radar for us, but there may be things that commit that the committee has not thought of and or that parents or community members have a perspective on. So I think they should come and share, share their perspective. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Mahan. Were there any other questions? Okay, that brings us to correspondence. Did any board members have correspondence? Ms. Friedel? Um, I just wanna share that on Saturday, um, Mrs. Uh, Stern, Mrs. Tong and I uh, were uh, attended the, um, the anti-Asian hate rally uh, at the Cherry Hill Library. Dr. Malash was there um, and so was Dr. Morton. Uh, Dr. Malash, I'm sure you may speak to it as well, but um, it was a wonderful turnout. I think about 500 people 
um, speakers. We had student speakers from Cherry Hill as well as, as students from other communities in South Jersey. And there were uh, different elected officials who also spoke, both local elected officials and from other parts of New Jersey. Um, it, was, um, it was a very nice turnout uh, on Saturday. Thank you, Ms. Friedel. Mr. Avadia, did you also have correspondence? I did, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Neary. Um, so NJSBA sent me a, a certificate in the mail. I was, I was kind of joking around with Mrs. Matlack. That they told us, okay, yes. They told us that in lieu of celebrating us as they normally would, we could celebrate ourselves. So rather than make a crazy spectacle of it, they awarded me the new board member boardsmanship certification. Uh, which is lovely. Um, and since, you know, this isn't my professional calling necessarily, uh, this is my volunteer development, uh, extra stuff that I've been able to put in. And rather than take the victory lap that, I, lap that I so richly deserve, I thought I would use the time to just say like, you know, NJSBA has some cool stuff, right? And so there are individual certifications, there are award certifications. This one was helpful for my personal education. I hope to leverage my many learnings. Uh, but for folks that are interested in like green or STEM, there are specific curricula around that. For people who are like master, master boardsmanship people like Mrs. Matlack, there's a whole like trajectory of like 30 years of education that can be done. So I would just say to my fellow board members, you know, avail yourself if you, if you wish. I do feel it was worthwhile. Um, and so that is my brief victory lap uh, for completing and checking all the boxes. If you are in your first two years uh, of service on this board, you too may get the new board member boardsmanship certificate. And I encourage you with any questions to, to come to me at any time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Abadi, and congratulations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Was there any other correspondence? Okay. Dr. Malash, did you have any comments? Uh, just brief ones since the, I don't, I don't normally speak until the second meeting, so I don't want to get anybody wound up, but I, I do just want to echo it. Um, this is uh, what Ms. Bridell talked about with the rally on Saturday. Uh, it really was fantastic to see so many people from across the wide spectrum of our community to join together in solidarity in the parking lot at the library. Um, elected officials, volunteers, uh, members of the Asian American group, Pacific Island from across South Jersey, um, people of all different backgrounds, the Police Department, uh, our students, our staff members, uh, to see people come together. Again, the greatest strength that we have lies uh, in our ability to join together and to move forward together. It's what has allowed us as a school district to continue to progress, even during the times of the pandemic, uh, continue the good work uh, for the, the work that our teachers do, the work that our families have done, the work that our students have done. But that opportunity on Saturday to see, hear so many, have the opportunity to hear so many people speak so passionately, so authentically about their own personal story, I think makes a difference. Uh, and I think it's something that we have to continue to remind ourselves as a board of education, as a school district, we adopted an anti-racism policy back in the fall. And it's not just enough to say that we believe it, but it's in our words and in our actions and the deeds that we choose to undertake and in being overt and how we approach situations that truly makes the difference. Um, so I was very appreciative to see the people that were able to attend. And again, so many people from across our community who were there um, continue to be involved. Voice matters, right? People's voices matter to us and to what we do. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the first public comment. There will be two opportunities for public comment this evening. The first public comment session is for agenda items only. There will be another public comment section for any topic at the end of the meeting. And as usual, we will take those on the line first. And then once we've gone through that, we will then go ahead and move to any written submissions. And I ask that you please state your full name and your address and the agenda item you will be speaking to. Okay, and the first one is a telephone number. So if you could please uh, state your full name, your address and agenda item. 
Okay, Jeff Potowitz, 110 Kilburn Drive, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. The agenda item is 12.3, adoption of the 2021-2022 budget. I was going over the agenda for today's school board meeting, and I saw item 12.3. I looked at the budget breakdown from the revised initial submission for 2021-2022, and the dollar amount was $222,545,000. Um, $222, uh, I think 302 for the proposed 2021-2022 budget for a 0.1 percent increase or $278,000 approximately. Um, however, in 12.3, the total base budget is $228,615,644. That is a $6,349,072 increase, or approximately 2.9%, not 0.1%, over the 2020-2021 budget. Figure okay. To put those numbers in perspective, the 2019-2020 actual budget was twenty two hundred million eighty six thousand and ninety ninety nine hundred thirty five dollars. The 2020 2021 is listed as twenty two hundred twenty two million two hundred sixty six thousand five hundred ninety two for an increase in that year of approximately twenty two million dollars or approximately eleven percent. So the increase in our school budget for next year is substantially less, but still the increase is 2.9%, not 0.1%. How these additional $6 million plus be spent? Will there be, will, how will these, where will these funds be accounted for in the user-friendly budget? And also, will this $6 million plus an additional revenue be used to supplant other funds that may be more flexible in use. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Potowitz. Okay. Next, we have Rick Short. Hello, Rick Short, 1002 Shelton Parkway. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first off, about the upcoming budget, uh, I've mentioned this before, what is missing in the budget is just uh, basic locks available in schools. I've pointed out before, over a year ago, privately in emails, that there are doors that aren't lockable in a lockdown. This, to me, is not acceptable for a school to have a lockdown and not be able to lock doors. The second thing... Again, I mentioned last year in the budget was pavement repair at Carusi and Kingston. This is also not in the budget. I find it unbelievable that four years ago, a student was injured at a track at Carusi. And what happened was the track was removed. Again, there are sidewalk spots. They are not large and they, they are not being repaired. It makes no sense with a $220 million budget that you are not repairing sidewalks. Second, or third, should I say. Again, simple things to be done for drop-off safety are not being implemented. Signs where children cross in front of cars should be in place. Simple things that are missing in the budget. I hope you consider these things this year in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Short. Okay, next we have Carolina Bevid. Please state your full name, address, and agenda item. Hi, my name is Carolina Bevid. My address is 1213 Cropwell Road. The agenda item I'm speaking on is the We Return to Learn agenda item. Um, I noticed that only one board member asked a question after Dr. Mahan's presentation. And I just wanted to mention some questions that I would ask if I were on the board. The first one is, are remote Mondays best serving all of our students? Next, um, are half days cheating students a valuable instructional time that they'll need to scaffold lessons upon for next school year? Um, is there instructional consistency across schools on remote Mondays? 
And finally, has any research been done into why families chose the options they chose, remote or hybrid, and how is the district addressing families' needs? So for instance, if families are choosing remote because of scheduling difficulties, or if they're choosing hybrid, but they don't really want to because of childcare needs, does the district know that? And is there any outreach being done for those families? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bevitt. Okay, next we have Mel B. And please state your full name, address, and agenda item. Melissa Bush, 420 Lavender Hill Drive. Um, I'm speaking on agenda item 7.1. We return to learn. There is a ton of discussion at board meetings about equity, but I just saw an update about going returning to school and it mentions elementary students, but there has been no mention of self-contained students or any other special education students. What are the plans for them? That's it. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mrs. Bush. Okay. Okay, seeing no others. Mrs. Sugars, were there any uh, written submissions? Yeah, I have uh, quite a few. Um, the first is from Colleen Spagnuolo. I would like to confirmation from the district that is it is the plan is still five full days of in-person learning for the fall. I would like to know more specifics as to the details for that plan regarding lunch to seems that to be the only reason why kids are not currently full day. Is the district going to do staggered lunch in the cafeteria or hire more aides to supervise the children eating in the classroom? I want to know what the district is planning for now. Jennifer Lieberman, mother of a fifth grader and eighth grader, please bring our children back to school for five days of in-person learning immediately. They're worth it. There have been no explanations given to keep them remote learning on Mondays. They need every minute of learning they can possibly get. The afternoons are lacking in learning and structure. Laney and Daniel Begel, Recent correspondence with Dr. Malash, she explained the reasoning behind remote days is to provide opportunity for instructional staff to meet with students in the same manner via a virtual platform. If parents choose to keep their kids remote, we certainly respect that decision. That said, as there is no indication or reasoning that warrants remote half-day learning for the majority of our children, we must provide families the option of, of five full days in-person instruction. Please do not penalize those children who want and need to be in school five full days. I think we can all recognize the current schedule was meant as a temporary fix. It's time to return full -time to full-time education in Cherryville. Kim Gallagher, I appreciate the recent efforts to bring the Cherryville students into the classroom. I know that this takes a lot of planning and it's been successful. As spring comes and cases lower, it is time to increase from half day to full day instruction. The warmer weather will allow for open windows, which is shown as an effective way to circulate air. Increasing instructions a full day is beneficial to the students for many reasons. First of all, more time in school means more instruction. It is clear learning loss has happened over the 12 months and increasing time in the classroom will mean less intervention next year. Secondly, moving to full day instruction will be a good gauge and starting point for the district. Your ultimate goal is five full days for the 21-22 school year. Begin the process now. Making this change will allow you to see what works and what doesn't and we'll provide the summer to make any necessary changes prior to the school year starting in September. Finally, opening for full day instruction will provide goodwill to the parents in the community. You have lost the trust of many families in the district and many do not trust your plans for the fall. Providing our children with a full day instruction is a step in the direction of regaining that trust. We hope you make these changes as soon as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. Steve Tulo, it's part of a recent story by ABC6, in regard to Governor Murphy's announcement that he expects children to be in school by this fall, the following response from Dr. Malash was included. It's exciting children belongs in school. Children belong in schools. Couldn't agree more. And although I do not know the district is, I do not, I do know the district is planning for a five in-person schedule in the fall, which is great. The question is why not now? Why wait? What is preventing this? Now is the time to make five days a reality in order to provide, provide the benefits of in-person instruction that our children and families need and deserve. 
start the transition process now so that any improvements may be identified and implemented sooner rather than later and allow our teachers and children to hit the ground running at full this coming fall. Cherry Hall has an opportunity to be an example of proactive forward thinking for others to view as a model of success. Jody Gilman, it is crucial that Cherry Hill Public Schools move to full, pop, full day in person this school year. The fact that we are still dealing with this lack of leadership is unacceptable. Private schools never went remote and most have had zero issues. Even summer camps opened last year with no issues. For example, Liberty Lake. Our local competing districts are back in school as are many districts all over New Jersey. We know based on scientific data, data from the Academy of Pediatrics, children do not spread COVID. Dr. Malash, it is your responsibility to bring our children back to school full-time immediately. Board of Ed, it is your responsibility to keep our superintendent focused on the needs and wants of his constituents. This is at a point now that is frankly ridiculous. Based on your, our education tax, we have become the laughing stock of the state. We voted you in and we will vote all of you out put our children back in school full time. Gina Raval, our family is very appreciative of the added days at this time, but we are still hopeful to at a minimum get back Mondays as well. What is the reason not to be in person on Monday? Please bring our children back on Mondays as soon as possible. Every day counts and our children are worth it. We will truly love five, we would truly love five full days in person. The Mondays are a positive start. Sarah Barone, why is the district keeping Mondays fully remote for students. It is of utmost importance that the district not only get the students back five days a week, but five full days as soon as possible this year. This will allow the students and schools and faculty to get back on track for five full days prepared for next school year. Carly Cohen, please bring our children back to school for five full days of in-person learning immediately. My second and fourth grade my second and fourth grade are unnecessarily suffering because of this. All of these elementary school student kids, school kids are suffering. Please return Mondays as an in-person day. Please line the halls with towels for lunch. This is working great PA schools. Please, they are worth it. Michelle and Scott Edmondson, our children are missing valuable in-person learning on Monday and every afternoon as the day to continue, it will become harder and harder for children to adapt to five full days again. Virtual learning is still not easy at our house. Our children, first and second grade, are sad when they have to learn virtually. Independent work during the school day is a struggle as well. It just doesn't work for our family, and we are suffering. I've seen a positive improvement when we started back for four half days, but it is not enough. They need the benefit of a full day in-person learning every day. The mental well-being of our children and their education are suffering this year, but they do not have to any longer. Many other schools are moving to five full days. Many private schools have been five full days all along. Why wait until the fall? Science is in our favor. No more excuses. We need to move to five full days now. At the very least, please make Mondays an in-person school day immediately. Please tell us that there are plans to make this happen. Thank you for your time and efforts. I'd like to address two we return to learn topics. The first topic is Mondays. Why are Mondays Still remote. Oh, I'm sorry, Lauren Greenberg. I would like to address two we returned we return to learn topics. The first topic is Mondays. Why are Mondays still remote? I have heard Dr. Malash say that since 40% of students are still remote, the district needs to make sure they take everyone's needs into account and use Mondays as a day for everyone to be on the same platform. I have a real issue with that explanation, given the fact that he and the administration didn't take my children and many others need into account when they decided to spend the majority of the year in a remote environment when these students needed in-person learning. And Dr. Malash and the administration aren't taking these student needs into account now by continuing to keep Mondays as a remote learning day. For the kids that are in person, it is disruptive to their learning to have them pivot back to all remote one day a week. And quite frankly, it doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, what is the breakdown of the 40% of all remote students by level, elementary, middle, and high school, based on the low number of in-person students being reported to the high schools, I can guarantee you that most of the 40% are high school students. So why not bring the elementary students back five days a week? Why are there separate we return we returned to learn committees for elementary, middle, and high school if Dr. Malash and the administration are going to continue to treat them all the same anyway? Dr. Malash has been doing this all school year and it's enough already. The learning needs of a first grader are vastly different than the learning needs of an 11th grader. Treat them that way. Second topic I'd like to address is returning students to five full days a week of in-person learning this school year. 
everything around is opening up more and more, and most of the adults in the school buildings vaccinated, as well as the science that shows that children are not spreaders of COVID. Why isn't the district bringing back to school five full days a week this year? It feels like the district is patting themselves on the back for bringing students back four half days a week and not willing to put in the effort to add more in-person learning this year. This is unacceptable. The school year's not even over, yet there is talk of a prom and a senior class trip to Disney. How is it possible that these events are staying but full days of school or not? How can you possibly prioritize these events over our children's education? Open the five full days a week before school ends. Our kids are worth it. Tracy Hoffman, please bring our children back to school for five full days of in-person learning. We need to keep moving forward toward a regular school schedule. If four days of in-person learning is proving to work and still be safe, then five days should be no different. Our children's education and socialization has suffered long enough. Please help get our kids closer to their life before COVID by taking this small step. Megan Chase, Dr. Malash, please bring our children back to school for five full days of in-person learning immediately. There's no logical reason for this not to be in place right now. Please do not make yourself look as unprepared and lackadaisical as you did in the fall in your efforts or lack of to get kids back to school. Allowing the children to return to school five full-time five days a week will now will permit for better preparation for how the fall will look. As a superintendent, I am sure you are aware that most operational problems are unknown until you actually start your process. This is the perfect time to work out any of the operational kinks that will surely come about. We just not go into the 21-22 school year 10 steps behind like we did for the 2021 school year. Children deserve much more than what Cherry Hill Public Schools offered them this past year. Thank you. Kelly Gasly, my children, a second and fifth grader, have been attending school four days a week since that option became available in Cherry Hill. Their energy and enthusiasm for school has been palpable during this time. They are eager to go out the door in the mornings and return more rejuvenated. The difference of being in school in person is so clear to our family. I am mindful of several trends in our community, including rising or stagnant, stagnant rates of COVID, juxtaposed with ever-increasing rates of vaccination. But the rate that strikes me the most is how few cases are happening at our schools and most importantly, how the district hasn't seen the spread of cases when they do occur. This aligns with what studies are overwhelmingly telling us now about COVID in schools that with proper precautions, all of which Cherry Hill is taking, teachers and students can be safely in school. It is now time for Cherry Hill to take the next steps. First Monday should become a regular school day while teachers are busy on Mondays jumping around to small groups, students are very much not. There is very little instruction and very little social emotional learning, not because of teachers, but because of, of the dictated structure of Mondays. It is time for the experiment with Mondays to end as it were to become a regular school day. Second, it is time for parents, for students to be returned to the classroom full time five days a week. Yes, it will take new planning and execution by the administration and the principals. Yes, there are nine weeks of school remaining in the school year. Nine weeks is almost a quarter of the school year. It is significant and deserves our innovation and creativity to give students back a fraction of what they've missed over the last year. Start the pilot of full day school at elementary schools where students are in most need of full time, time school and student numbers are smaller. Instead of the typical two lunch shifts, create four lunch shifts. If you need parent volunteers to provide lunch or recess supervision, ask. Many of us will readily volunteer to make this happen for our children. I implore you, tell us how we can help find a way to make it happen. There is no need or reason to wait until the fall that outweighs the needs of the children. And that is the end of our public comment for the first public comment period. Okay, great. Thank you, Mrs. Sugars. So that brings us now to the board work session. We'll start with curriculum and instruction and I will turn it over to Mrs. Matlack. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. Um, the Curriculum and Instruction Committee met uh, on Monday, April 5th at 7 p.m. And we had several items on our agenda. The first one was a master's research project. Isabella Kazarowski is an art teacher in one of our elementary schools. And she is doing a master's program research project through Rowan University that will examine the impact on mood and emotions of art education on students. Uh, her research will not include any names or identifying information um, regarding any of the students. 
The second item on our agenda was the New Jersey School Performance Reports for 2019-2020. Um, as of our meeting, those results were embargoed until April 7th, which was last Wednesday. Um, and uh, Dr. Mahan discussed how the reports will look different this year based on the lack of data available from the NJSLA testing. Um, our third item on the agenda was the Open Syed Middle School sixth grade. Um, we decided due to time uh, for the meeting, we decided to move that agenda item to our May meeting. So we'll have an update on that from Mr. Goldthorpe uh, in May. Uh, so we went on to the uh, fourth item, middle school math. And that was led by Mr. Scott Goldthorpe and members of the math leadership team were also present uh, for our meeting to, to help out with discussion and answer our questions. The group shared information on restructuring of the seventh grade math sequence to provide access and equity for all students. Um, they talked to us about um, how they got input uh, for their uh, consideration in what to do. And they uh, looked at student voice and that the student voice was shared through STEM portfolio. Um, and that uh, some students uh, expressed that they felt the tracking to be uh, segregating. The teacher voice that they next looked at, um, the teachers noted differences in demographics um, in, in the current levels. And the principal voice, um, spoke up and, and, and talked about merging levels with targeted support can provide greater access to higher levels for more of our students. Um, and so the recommendations from the math leadership team was to detract the academic and enriched seventh grade math, implement Eureka math grades six to eight, and uh, for curriculum-based professional learning. So they talked about the timeline. Um, they started this back in the fall of 2019. Um, they have been doing the work since then. They um, came to us and talked at our CNI meeting to let us know what was going on. The next step is messaging to the community and our families about um, what the next steps will be. Uh, there will be a math institute with and with implementation in the fall of 2021. And then we, uh, the CNI committee of the board will get updates um, on this again in the winter of 2021, 22. Um, uh, there were some, some other items that were talked about. Uh, what will the Just Math program look like and increasing opportunity for all and access for all and what the supports for the students will look like. Um, the last item on our agenda was policies. So Mrs. Wethington uh, talked about uh, the policy for no child left behind, policy 2415. And so we are updating the language on that to reflect the, the current um, Every Student Succeeds Act. So we also talked about 24, policy 2415.01, academic standards, academic assessments, and accountability. Uh, this policy is being abolished because it codified no child left behind, and that has been changed. And then the last one was policy 2415.02, Title I, fiscal responsibilities, adding a section on supplement not to replant. Um, under old business, uh, Dr. Mahan addressed a question uh, from the last meeting by one of the board members uh, about high school start time. So uh, we, they, we were provided some information about, um, about that and how that has been um, the historical piece of what has happened uh, with the high school start time, where we are right now with the high school start time in this um, hybrid environment and that the conversation is ongoing about that. Um, and then under new business, uh, there was a question about uh, remote learning next year 
and Dr. Mahan did address this in her We Return to Learn plan, um, but I just wanted to let you know that that was also brought up at our meeting, um, but nothing new to add there. Uh, do any uh, committee members have anything that they would like to add uh, to our discussion that we had that night? Uh, Ms. Arorio. Thank you. Um, just that the conversation around the math curriculum and the questions and, and the way the staff um, addressed some of their concerns and approaching why they wanted to move in this model were at exactly on point with the way the district has been focusing on race equity. And so I look forward to that continued conversation because I think it's aligned, per is aligned perfectly with what the vision for the next several years will be. And I think it, it's a, it's, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it as, um, as they progress, especially the university and, and professional development component. I think that's gonna be um, super beneficial for, for everybody at the district in, as they transition to this. Thank you, that's an excellent point. Anybody else? Yeah, that captures it nicely. Thank you, Mrs. Matlock and Ms. Rorio. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see any, Mrs. Neary, so I'll turn it back to you. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, next we have business and facilities and I will turn that over to Mrs. Schultz. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. So we had an action-packed meeting at business and facilities. We met on April 6th at 5.45. So I have a lot of numbers, so I will happily um, restate if anybody has any questions and I'll do my best to get all of the numbers exactly right. Um, so uh, we did have a couple policies that we reviewed. The first one was the policy in reg 7425. It had to do with the lead testing of the water in our schools. And the biggest change, this policy has been updated to reflect the changes in the law that now require lead testing in schools to be done every three years and Instead of every six years. So just as some background on this, um, the last time the testing was done was in 2016. And at that time, 555 samples were taken. And out of that, 28 had indicated higher than acceptable lead levels. And at that time, um, most of those high tests were found in bubblers in the elementary classroom. So since then, the district has eliminated the bubblers in all the classrooms, except for the kindergarten classrooms where they were required and they replaced those in those kindergarten rooms with new ones. The district has also been eliminating water fountains and replacing them with water bottle filling stations. And so we're hoping that the efforts should minimize any samples with higher than acceptable lead levels. The district is now gonna be um, required to review test results within 72 hours of receiving them. And we are looking to retest again in the 2021-2022 school year. So just a lot of information about this new policy in red. The next one we reviewed was policy 6360. It had to do with political um, contributions. And this was uh, some minor wording changes, specifically eliminating NCLB and replacing it with federally funded programs. Um, the next one we reviewed was policy and regulation 7430. It had to do with school safety. This policy is no longer required as a legal requirement. And so this policy will be abolished. Uh, the next uh, thing on the agenda was, was the review of the public hearing budget. So our, the district's initial submission has not been reviewed by the county office as of yet, uh, but our public hearing on the budget um, is not until April 27th. So we are expecting to receive this um, next week. So we're not, um, not concerned about that um, yet. And then I'm gonna get into some numbers now. We spent the next part of the meeting talking about the ESSER II and the American Rescue Plan Act funding numbers. So I'll start with the ESSER funds. They were made available at the beginning of March 15th, 2021, and we have uh, we can spend those funds up until September 30th of 2023. So how those funds break down, we have about 3.4 million. It's actually $3,489,663,000 of funds. 
We have another $223,948,000 out of that that can be used for learning loss or learning acceleration funds. And then another $57,625,000 that can be used towards mental health support and services. So that's how our SR2 funds break down. We talked about using the $3.4 million of that uh, to be used towards things such as PPE, technology, ventilation upgrades, and things of that nature. And what the, re the recommendation was, was really to take that money and kind of combine it with the American Rescue Funds to just kind of combine it made the most sense after we've had some discussions with um, Garrison. And when we look at the American Rescue Funds, the total amount of that and how that breaks down is it's a whole total amount of 9.4 million, but of that 9.4, that breaks down as $1.89 million would be allocated towards learning loss with the remaining um, 7.5 million allocated to kind of those same items um, being the, 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 pardon, uh, the portable air purifiers for classrooms, focusing really on the controls of the heating and the air, roofing projects and things of that nature. So that is kind of how those two funds break down. Um, and it, we're still kind of looking and understanding some of the kind of how all of that can really be spent, but just at a high level, that's how we know how it breaks down and kind of the, the higher overarching buckets of the funds. And then the committee also discussed logistics advantages of kind of public attendance at committee meetings. Ms. Friedel had made a suggestion um, about potentially having the committee chair attend um, live in person and then opening up the committees um, to uh, community members being live. And we talked about that. Um, by the time we had that discussion and we kind of talked through all of these numbers, um, it was time for us to move um, to strategic planning and our meeting ended. So um, we did have a really good, great, healthy conversation. So I will ask um, Ms. Friedel or Mrs. Tong if you have any other comments that you would add before we open it up to questions. Lots of numbers. I do not see any other comments, but um, are there any questions? This is, it looks like Mr. Avadia has his hand up. Yes. Ms. Stratton and Mr. Warrior. All right, so, uh, so I'm. So, Ms. Schultz, thank you. Thank you very much. So, can you just walk me through it? So, you said that the recommendation was so a committee chair would come like to Malbert and then open it up to. I, I just wanted to just get clarity on kind of what the suggestion was. Yeah, I think that was just one suggestion. We kind of started to talk about um, committee meetings at the end and what Ms. Friedel, and I, Ms. Friedel, please jump in if I get this wrong, but what we had talked about was potentially, you know, not necessarily had to be the committee chair, but if one member of the committee um, attended live at Malberg and then inviting um, committee meetings open to the public where the public could be live. And we talked about just kind of what that might look like and kind of the options. That way we could kind of have um, open committee meetings again. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Mr. Stratton. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Schultz. I was asking um, just for clarifications, the, the the item you mentioned that got replaced in the kindergarten rooms, what did you say that they, they were? Is it those water bottle thingies or we got at rid of one thing to for lead abatement? What was it? Yeah, Mrs. Um, it was, I just want to make sure I'm saying, was it that we replaced the bubblers? Bubblers, okay. What, what, I don't know my, what those were. So that's why I was like, what? Are those? <laughs> oh. A water, <laughs> Mrs. Sugars, I want to make sure I'm relaying it. I'm, we are talking about water fountains, uh, bubblers, water fountains in the kindergarten classrooms, and we replaced those with water bottle, water bottle filling stations. Am I correct on that? No, not exactly. So we had 
uh, bubblers are the little uh, water fountains that you would see attached to the sinks in the kindergarten and some of the younger grade classrooms. And that seemed to be where our issue was the last time we did this, whether it was something within the bubbler itself. So we removed them um, out of the rooms where we didn't need them. We replaced them in the other rooms to make sure we didn't have that issue moving forward. In addition, we have also replaced a lot of our water bottle our water fountains that are in the hallways with water bottle filling stations that have filtered water that go through them. So between those two measures, we're not anticipating uh, many issues when we redo the lead testing this summer. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I just, I, I was sitting here and was like, I'm just gonna ask it, don't know what it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then my second question is, um, I love that we have those extra funds, but just to be clear, those are one-time things because of COVID, correct? Like this, this won't be something we'll get again next year. This is strictly just from, it, from the pandemic. That's my understanding. This is. And Ms. Arroyo. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I missed this. I was trying to write down as much as you were saying. Um, the. Is there like a time frame that you have to have like a full plan for the additional funding? I don't know. Was or is that already allocating? You already just have to now move on it. So the uh, ESS ER funds, the application is due May 14th. So we have to uh, have a plan developed prior to May 14th so that we can submit our application. The American Rescue Plan numbers. Uh, I was in a training today and it doesn't sound like we're going to have any guidance on that until May uh, at the earliest. So we're not sure what that timeline looks like just yet. The hope was that we could kind of look at both at the same time and allocate funds between the two grants, um, you know, that would complement each other. But I don't know if we're going to have enough information from uh, the state at that point to do that. So um, what we know right now is that ESSER is due May 14th and that we're waiting additional information on the American Rescue Plan. Okay. All right, there are no other I do questions. Not Was there anything else, Mrs. Schultz? I apologize. Uh, I was just going to say, I don't see any other questions. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so then that brings us to the human resources work session. And I will turn that back to you, Mrs. Schultz. Yep, thank you. So our HR committee, we met April 6th. We met at 5 p.m. We also had another uh, pretty packed agenda for HR. And we are able to report out. Uh, I think this might be our first meeting where we have a lot that we're able to report out. Uh, we, so it might be uh, the first time, but we did um, have also a lot of policies that we reviewed. So we started uh, the first thing, we did have a job description revision that we reviewed. And then after we talked about that, we then went into some policies. So the first policy was policy 1643, it was the family leave. This will take place of our other leave policies that are going to be abolished through our PML um, agenda. Um, so policy 1643 will be a will be added to our HR agenda for the April cycle for the first reading. And it will then again move to this policy will move to PNL for the May meeting to review and then to the May agenda cycle for the second reading. Um, we then reviewed the proposed changes on policy 4125, which was the employment of support staff members. This will be added to the HR agenda again for the April cycle for the first reading. And then this will also then be moved to PNL for the May meeting for review and then for the May agenda cycle. We talked about the next four policies. They are going to be abolished. It's the 3431.1 family leave. 4431.3 is also family leave, and then 3431.3 and 4431.3, which is the New Jersey Family Leave Insurance Program. And then the last policy that we did talk about is policy 2415.03, which is um, highly, highly qualified teachers. Uh, 
this will take the place of all other um, uh, part of that of highly, uh, highly qualified. I just need to go back. That I'm sorry. That's also going to that policy will also be um, abolished as as well. And then we reviewed the new policy, which is 1643, the family leave. This will take the place of all of our other leave policies, which were we talked through. Um, this will be added again. This policy is going to be 41 pages long. It's going to merge all of our other policies into one policy, specifically talking about um, the family lead, uh, FMLA. It's going to cover our New Jersey State FLA um, and also our family leave insurance. Um, and some of the questions that we asked um, was where this was coming from. And this is just a policy alert from Strauss SMA. Um, and this will then just be a general policy for all of our, um, for all employees. So um, just kind of some questions that came up. And then two things to note um, on page six and on page 22 of this new policy, um, we will be using a rolling calendar for our dates for leave um, for the timelines for FMLA and for FLA. This is a, this is not new to the district. We have always done this, but I just want to point out um, just the dates for the rolling calendar as you are looking through this policy. So um, I believe that is all that I can talk about in regards to our HR agenda. And Ms. Stratton, I don't know if you have anything else to add from our uh, pretty lengthy meeting of HR. Oh, that was perfect. Great job. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Any questions? All right. Well, all of those policies will be coming to PL shortly. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Schultz. Okay, that brings us to policy and legislation. I'll turn that over to Ms. Rydell. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schultz. We will look forward to the policies. Um, so we met on um, April 5th. Uh, the legislative update, there really was no update. Um, we were scheduled to have a visit by the county commissioners on March 26. However, that was uh, postponed. Uh, we do not have a new date. And we are uh, expecting to have Senator Beach visit on April 21st. And I believe that um, Mayor Shinangula is, uh, is expected to be visiting uh, along with Senator Beach. Um, we then moved into uh, the March, uh, the student activity fee. So annually, uh, the board has to look at the student activity fee. Um, uh, we have not changed the, the fee in, in quite a while. Uh, the fee is uh, used for any uh, club or activity where there is a stipend provided to the um, advisor. Um, at fair funding, at the last fair funding committee meeting, which um, I was not able to attend, uh, but uh, Dr. Malash shared that there was a recommendation or an idea from one of the participants about not um, having an activity fee for a year or two years um, as it relates to the bond uh, process. So um, that would be something as we discuss uh, the the future of the bond uh, a conversation to have about the student activity fee um, <clears throat> when that's in process. Uh, the recommendation from the administration is to not adjust the student activity fee for this year. Um, we then went into uh, the conversation about the school year calendars for 22-23 and 23-24. Um, and that was probably the bulk of our conversation uh, because in 2324, um, typically uh, the spring break that we have, uh, Easter and Passover fall at similar times. But in 2324, there is, I think, a two week difference between the two holidays. So a lot of talk, a lot of suggestions, a lot of ideas were thrown out um, as to how to look at the 2324 calendar. The, where we left off, we're not voting on this today. I believe uh, it will be on the, uh, the uh, action meeting in April, I think is the plan. So the next board meeting. But what we looked at was closing on Good Friday, 
um, doing an in-service day on Easter Monday. And then uh, Mrs. Weathington and Dr. Malosh, uh, did we land on closing the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of Passover? Yes. 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 Thank you. Yes. <laughs> no like, problem. Um, so and Ms. Friedel, just a small clarification. There's almost four weeks between um, Easter and Passover. Thank you, Mrs. Weathington. You're welcome. Um, so that that's kind of where we landed, but we thought that other board members may have some thoughts um, they wanted to share. We actually also threw out the, the, the concept that some school districts just pick a week and spring break is that week. So the third week of April, and it's always the third week of April, April or the second week of March or whatever, whatever it was decided. And that's spring break every year. Um, it's just food for thought, a concept. Uh, the next item that we discussed was the school and facility names. And um, it is being uh, recommended uh, by Dr. Malosh that we rename the Estelle Malberg Administration Building to the Arthur Lewis Administration Building. So in, in light of the policy, um, the criteria to rename the building after Mr. Lewis is, is met. Mr. Lewis uh, was a community leader. Um, he was on the school board. So uh, naming the administration building where the school board offices or the school board um, meetings are held seems to be appropriate. Um, he has a very rich history. He uh, was a, um, a leader in the federal government. Uh, he was the first African-American elected to the Cherry Hill School Board. Um, and, and he's made quite an impact in the, the community uh, of Cherry Hill. So there is a resolution to rename the building after him. Dr. Malash, you may wanna do more justice to the amazing work of Mr. Lewis than what I just did. <laughs> Um, I, think, yeah, I think you captured it pretty well, Ms. Fidel. He was the first African-American elected to the Board of Education um, and served from 1977 until 1983. Um, he and his wife settled here in Cherry Hill. They raised their family here in Cherry Hill. Uh, as, an employee, as an employee of the Department of Justice, um, he was the highest ranking African-American in the Department of Justice as appointed by President Carter. Um, after a 24-year career uh, working for the DOJ, uh, he then was a vice president uh, with the Sands Casino and worked in governmental affairs, uh, where he spent uh, more than two more decades. Uh, he and his wife were founding members of the Cherry Hill African American Civic Association, one of the longest standing and most philanthropic uh, civic associations that we have here in Cherry Hill. Um, he was inspiring. Uh, there's been articles and books published about Mr. Lewis uh, and his career. Uh, he was truly a local advocate in terms of civil rights uh, for students, for governmental employees, uh, and for citizens. Um, so I think it's, it's incredibly fitting. Mr. Lewis passed away uh, in the summer of 2019, um, and he had been predeceased by his wife. Um, but just again, a, a, a wonderful honor that we believe is, is something as an administrative group um, that we believe is incredibly important and fitting, again, uh, as a school district, when we take steps forward, uh, to improve what we're doing and how we're doing things. The recognition of Mr. Lewis um, and the historical significance of what he contributed to Cherry Hill, we believe um, it's a very fitting time to honor him. Thank you, Dr. Malash. Um, we also uh, went through the abolishment of policies. However, uh, my, my peers on the board in the different committees just went through all of them. So the family leave, the family leave insurance, the highly qualified teachers, the school safety, and the academic standards. Um, we did not have any first or second readings. Um, so I think that is my report, unless any of the other committee members have anything to add. Uh, Ms. Neary, I'm not seeing any hands, so. Uh, Ms. Elmore Stratton had her hand up. Thank you. Yes, I was just gonna say <laughs> that, thank you. Thank you, yes, I was just gonna add that Dr. Malosh shared a, a nice presentation on Mr. Lewis during our committee meeting and it was informative and 
<clears throat> he and his team have done some research even on the background of the of the school name that we all affectionately just called the Malberg um, and shared that with us because we did talk about that as well. And um, he, I just like the, the thoroughness of them at thinking this through. And then also he shared with, with us when was the last time we had done a name change on a building and, um, and, and how many of those we've done in the district and it's, it's not a lot. Uh, that we've done that. So I, I just wanted to offer that and then also offer that um, as a as a committee, we were really like pulling our eyelashes out over that calendar piece. <laughs> and so any suggestion from my colleagues, you know, please share with us because uh, we're being very, very thoughtful with it and, and really want, couldn't wait to tell you so that you can tell us what your thoughts are, so. <laughs> Mrs. Neary? Um, I guess it, it would be more of a question. Do we have an idea of how many school districts within this state actually just pick a week within March as some of our higher education and colleges do where that is just spring break? And then I'm guessing a number of students would have to take uh, their own days for the holidays. Do we have any idea how many actually do that versus what is being proposed now where we would have those two days around Easter and then uh, dates around Passover. I'll defer that to Dr. Malosh if he has any information. Not many, Mrs. Neary, it's anecdotal. The information that we have, I've never seen a chart of it. Um, I don't believe that there are any in Camden County or Burlington County that operate in that direction. Um, you know, most still do it traditionally um, either around, you know, one of, either around uh, Passover or around Easter. Uh, for those that still have spring breaks. Uh, some districts have modified the length of time or the amount of time that they have them because of other stuff that goes on within the school district. Um, but, you know, the, it's been, uh, we're only aware of, a, of anecdotally of uh, what's been shared with us as a couple. I can see what else we can find out through school boards, um, you know, and, and see what else is out there. But I, say, I don't believe that there are any in Camden County or Burlington County right now that are doing it with that model. Okay. And we haven't, do we have any feedback as to what other districts are doing around this um, conundrum as well or no, we haven't? Uh, similarly, not many other districts are yet looking at 23, 24. Um, because of the way we do our calendars, we like to try to prepare them uh, a couple of years in advance so that they're established on the website, families can plan their lives out uh, and that kind of thing. Um, as, a, as a district and as a community, typically we have more days off around Passover um, than most other districts in this area do. Um, you know, most other districts, it's uh, Easter. The Easter holiday is typically um, the biggest one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Tong has her hand and then Mrs. Matlack. Um, oh, um, the calendars, I just want to, I guess clear that do we have put the um the Chinese New and the Diwali New Year in place? I Mrs. Yes. 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 yes, yes, we have both. So the, the calendars, the calendars, Mrs. Tong, you know, reflect um, either having an in-service or a day or a day or a school closed for Diwali, uh, for Lunar New Year. Uh, and as we move forward with the 22. 23 and 23, 24 calendar, um, three Kings Day, uh, which is January 6th uh, as well. In 23, 24, it actually occurs on a weekend, uh, but in 22, 23, um, the sixth uh, three Kings Day is on a Friday. Right. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Mrs. Matlack. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say to the committee that I, I think you came up with a very good compromise uh, with, with the days off, days off for both and um, helping to accommodate, you know, as many families as possible and as many of our staff as possible as well, um, you know, with, with, their, with their face. Um, you know, the, it's a novel idea about picking a week uh, for spring break. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear more about it and, you know, consider the, um, you know, the, the, the downsides as well as the upsides to doing, to doing that before we take it under consideration, but it is a novel idea. 
Thank you. I, I Mr. Avati, I'm just making sure you don't have your hand up. <laughs> okay. All good. All good. <laughs> okay. Well done. Well done. I, I, I don't see any other questions, Mrs. Neary. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, well then that brings us to strategic planning work session. I'll turn that over to Mr. Avadia. All right, I'm trying to get the technology. I can't believe my technology faux pas last time. Can any people see me? Is this, okay, great. Uh, so strategic planning, I won't go into having called the meeting as an hour and it being an hour and a half. We'll, 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 we'll just pretend that it went all to plan. But basically April 6th at 7 p.m., you know what, we delved into really a lot of strategic planning. Yeah, probably one of our most intense meetings since I've been on the board of strategic planning. We, we launched into a couple of things. So first of all, as we know, Mrs. Sugars did a great job working with me and, and Dr. Malash to create a calendar of topics. The final topic was broached in our last meeting for this year. In other words, as far as we've planned, the last new thing we wanted to cover was 21st century learning trends. And so we asked Dr. Malaj to kind of tee up, not so much a full discussion about 21st century learning trends, which would have had us there probably for three to four months, but rather something that would get us started to understand where does this committee fit in this? And this is one of the many reasons I'm glad Mrs. Matlock's on this committee to think about, look, you know, this is really, it sounds like CNI, so what belongs in strategic so Dr. Malash did some really good history around educational priorities, such as No Child Left Behind and different things. We talked about our strategic planning goals. We talked about our district mission statement um, to try to put it into context. And then a few committee members kind of said, look, how do we think about the buildings and how they facilitate curriculum? Maybe that's what belongs in strategic planning. Um, and Mrs. Neary's example uh, brought back building trades, which would come up later. So it was some good foreshadowing. Um, I recall Mrs. Matlack saying, look, a lot when STEM labs were all the rage, a lot were built, a lot of those are sitting empty a lot of the time. So the, 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 touch, the touch word seems to be flexibility in learning, flexibility in space, and thinking about you know, what that can look like as we think about you know, large investments in our buildings and what that can be. Um, another issue, another item that was mentioned is local partnerships. For example, the virtual program that exists now um, and how that could extend the classroom through partnerships versus spaces solely within our buildings. Um, and then we really, I think, came to some kind of consens consensus that we really need to figure out around 21st century learning a phrase that's used very often and can mean many things, what is it we really value? And based on that, to think about what 21st century learning means to our district, to our team, and then of course to the, to the children involved. So it was really good, uh, really good. We did talk about how a legacy of no child left behind and then a focus on standardized testing did shortchange what we were able to do in promoting the trades. Now, you know, as we know, fairly sought after in the world. Um, and that's where Mr. Garrison sort of jumped in and, and talked about how other districts he works with have really put specific focus on specific trades. Um, he talked about welding, electrical, mechanical, carpentry. He talked about Pensacon that went into textile and culinary. He talked about Del Ran, which went into robotics, auto shop, and advanced manufacturing. Uh, he talked about that there's some grant money available for these types of efforts, but fundamentally that you have to start from a place, I think we all agree by the end of it, uh, that you have to start from a place of what do you value, what, you know, what are you rallying the community behind, what can the community accept? So, so it's a longer term topic with no, with I think two things that we suggested. One, as we work into the long range facilities plan and roll this out to the community to get some feedback on this issue. Um, and two, you know, we're meeting with people in government, or at least our board leadership is, to think about like, what advice do they have? Um, you know, we, I mean, I mentioned that I know that Commissioner Young, who we're supposed to meet with, is a carpenter. He was a carpenter for 25 years. I mean, he sees value in trades. So you should talk to people who know trades as well 
in some fact finding. And, and that's where I believe we left it as a committee. Issue two, we talked about Mr. Garrison's presentation that he did last time we met as a full board, I guess, yes. And so we talked about, you know, we, 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 like, uh, we like Bob, um, even before he's buying us breakfast at, at Ponzio's, which surely should come in the future. Um, you know, we thought the presentation was good, reflected, you know, what he knows and, and all he can kind of offer. And we did talk about the fact that now that this has been presented to the board and to the public, um, the conversations have started. Um, you know, as a board, we're not really part of those conversations, except in our own ecosystem. And so we talked about, you know, how do we become facilitators of the community conversation that we all agree must happen? We also talked about, you know, getting smaller groups together, getting some feedback loops. Um, how do we get past the current environment of schools in the country, in our region, in our district, of course, uh, to have some of these conversations that are surely important, uh, but that need a, a certain forum. Um, and I won't say which board member, but we did start down a path of thinking about what does this board really believe? And I think this is where we kind of got stuck into a committee is that the committee itself can't decide what this board believes. Um, and so, you know, this is where it's nice to have, you know, Mrs. Neary on our committee to say, look, you know, at some point we need to figure out as we plan our strategic planning committee work. Where does this board want to go? Because where Ben wants to go is fairly uninteresting and it surely doesn't move any needles anywhere. So we really talked about trying to really have a good, honest, inclusive, multi-layered you know, series of engagements with the board um, somehow to figure out what can the majority of this board get behind because now I mentioned that you know we, we exhausted or we started our last topic of this. So where do we go from here? So as a committee, it was really kind of like a moment where it was like, look, we're going to need some input from outside to continue our phenomenal work in the in committee, which we surely must continue. So there was a lot of talk like that. That was number two. Number three, you'll recall that we left. Well, we could argue over semantics. People in the world call this redistricting. We talked about it several times we had a town hall about it um, but you know we did talk to administration about all right what when do we revisit this the administration said look we've got to get past the, the the first budget we did that so we did ask dr Mawash to present um what would the what could well, let's put this, what could the timeline look like from here to revisit the issue of redistricting and i guess what's important here to, to understand is we know from our last discussion where we left this, we needed more meat on the bones. We needed to understand what a plan would be. And so as Dr. Mawash presented this back to us, we really could start looking at a plan you know, with rules and, and timelines and things like that, um, fully fledged in let's say August. Through a course of time, which would come to the board multiple times, come to the committee multiple times, have multiple town halls and at least one thought exchange. We could have a process that could end in this proposal by the end of this calendar year. And if we did all that, that meant that redistricting in person, live, uh, could happen as early as a year from this coming September, so September of 22. And so we looked at it and it seemed reasonable. Um, and so we did talk about now, he, here's where September of 2022 is a date I've said in another context. And Mrs. Sugar is very right to say, look, you're talking about you're going to start redistricting and you're going to put out a bond in the same month. That seems a little. So this is where we need some more input. But I think at least our, on a committee level, we felt strongly that we should do the redistrict. We shouldn't delay it, let's say, another year. You, know, you can only redistrict in September. Um, so if it's not you know, 22, then it would be 23. So I think the committee felt, I think there was consensus to say, look, it's, a, it's an aggressive timeline that was proposed, but we should, we should try to meet that. And then, you know, obviously we started talking about bond potentially for September or December, revisit 
previous conversation, we do need to know more about what the board wants. Because for example, if the board doesn't want a bond, it's a totally different conversation around redistricting because of the timing then, but I would not, you know, so anyway, there's a lot to think about. The last thing um, topics wise for the agenda was that, well, I don't know how important this is, but essentially like I had asked for something to be put on the agenda every week so people could weigh in on strategic planning. I felt in my heart that board members felt we were running away from the full board uh, with strategic planning, but now that you know all that I know, uh, I feel like it's it's uh, it doesn't make sense to have a strategic planning discussion item every time, in addition to new and old business often covers it, comes right after strategic planning. So I've already spent too much time talking about it, but essentially for the cadence of our full board meetings, you're welcome, it's gone. Uh, so that was great. We did spend some time talking about what marketing a bond could look like, especially if we're gonna do two big things at once, how to present this, um, and, and kind of like, you know, we've got to ask somebody because, you know, as a board, you know, we, we should own pieces of this, but we are not experts in um, communicating and messaging this to a community. At least, you know, we have, you know, th this is not our, our regular stuff. So we can certainly ask different places. We had, certainly have uh, various um, experts, but, you know, the bottom line was we discussed these kind of things and the, the idea was for us to really continue to do great work as a committee, we're going to have to understand what the board will it, and whatever it is, you know, we'll, we'll put a work plan together, um, but we must have additional information. And that's it. There was, I think, a brief discussion about what town halls might look like, um, and at least my feeling was, I, I think there was consensus, but I won't speak for everyone, but just to say, I don't want to go to a May town hall about a, about a long-range facilities plan or about crafting a bond, if there's not alignment on the board, I would much rather come back to the community to be able to speak to this in a two-way methodology when we do have some kind of consensus. Um, and I, I do believe that's the right way to go. Now, April, because of the thought survey, because of what people are saying or thought exchange and what people really told us, they want to talk about we return to learn. We're going to honor that, you know, or at least our, our committee recommends that. Uh, and so that would be Monday. But yeah, for May, we would need to have, I think, more input from the full board and, and definitive direction to really say, yeah, you know, May, let's talk about the garrison presentation, parts and pieces, long range facilities, these types of things. So that's kind of my slightly you know, energetic um, depiction of what happened, um, my, my three act play, so to speak. If anyone on the committee would like to, or, you know, administration or the board would like to add <laughs> items or items that I, I just, I felt there was consensus and just got wrong. You know, please feel free. Thank you, Mr. Avadia. No, I think you covered it um, quite nicely for the hour and a half. I think you summed it up. Thank you. I think Mr. Rorio had a oh. question. Sorry, Mrs. Arroyo. Yeah. I have a um, comment question. Um, you mentioned some districts focusing on certain trades, um, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with the, uh, the Workforce Development Board and how they've identified five, um, five areas that, like industry areas that uh, are like booming, I guess, in our region, specifically in our county. Um, and maybe those types of um, experiential learning um, would be, would be supportive in that in those like employee employment opportunity areas um, to incorporate not maybe not full trades but like that type of um, incorporate those types of internships and things like that so maybe that's part of the discussion um, as you're identifying that part of it look at what people the research that's already out there locally on what would be available to a student graduated from high school not interested in going right away to college or something like that. That's a great suggestion. Absolutely. Okay, so I yield back. Oh, no, okay. This is Elmore Stratton, yes. Okay. So, um, just okay. a quick question or quick thought. So is the next step for, because um, you mentioned that you want us to all make sure that we're in alignment. 
So is the next step for us as a team to discuss this in exact session? Like what is our, so that we get to where we need to be or what do we need to do to kind of flesh that out so that you have a, a definite a definite pathway of where your committee needs to be focused on? Or like basically how can we help you to clear, to unmuddy that? What do we need to do? That's a, look, that's a phenomenal question. Um, and frankly, I, I kind of wish, wish I knew. I mean, I, I would say that I think, well, yeah, you know what, rather than Paul, you know, you made the whole trip. <laughs> you know, I don't want to leave you out. It's okay. My, I mean, my guess is that we can't do it in the exact session. No. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, I mean, like, it, 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 um, look, I think there's just a fair point that everyone would think, like, you would just do it, you know, behind closed doors, but we don't get to do that. So, so Paul, like, how do we, like, let's learn from your wisdom. How do we kind of, well, you basically put it on an agenda for discussion at a board meeting. You can do it further in committee meetings, certainly uh, to refine it, but ultimately it has to be a board level discussion at a public meeting. Uh, you can have a special meeting to do that if you want, uh, or you can put it on one of the agendas and just have it as one of your topics. So I, I think, so, okay, and, and that's very helpful. Um, so I think where we left it is really like, you know, at, at some point, the committee work is sort of done. So we've sort of like really tasked, you know, Mrs. Neary, who, you know, who's, who's our leader after all. And mm -hmm. it, I was just going to jump in, Ben. Yeah, it really does just rise to her level. So yes. So I, I think one, I, I the way I understood it was we need alignment then that, you know, each board member would want to move forward with a bond plan. And then it's moving forward with redistricting, which I know we had the high level conversation, is there alignment amongst the board members and then administration could put forth a plan as to what that looks like. Um, we had some understanding from the community of where they were when we had that town hall and there was a lot of focus on the, the how of it. And make sure, you know, ensuring that there was um, a lot of focus on the transition and ensuring that that work was done there should, you know, the board decide to move forward it, it, with a plan if it is proposed. So those were two key things. And then as far as, you know, what does the board value as far as, you know, the, the direction of learning, which I think some of that is part of the strategic vision and the goals that we had worked on, not this year and the year prior, um, feels like a lifetime ago. Um, so some of that is there, right? Like that's where we looked at the trades and what is the direction. And Mrs. Matlack made a great point because Ms. Tong wrote it down because she was so excited by the words about really, is it just about flexibility and adaptability so that we could use the buildings how we see fit. And then, you know, to that point of, you know, the virtual program and is it, you know, partnering out in the community as Ms. Arorio mentioned, which I think, and it'll be great to get more information on that workforce development, it, you know, what's happening there and, and how do we partner so it's not just in the classroom. So that's the way I understood it and the conversation to happen amongst um, the full board to understand where everyone is in those two key areas. Ms. Mrs. Royal? So schedule it to have that conversation, right? Yes, preferably when it's so, something we can spend yeah. voted time to, I think. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I would suggest, and I'm sure, I mean, well, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I'm suggesting that, you know, just schedule it because if you're going to continue to have the conversation of where everybody's at, let's just have the conversation and find out where everybody's at. Agree. Can I, can I add to that, Mrs. Miri and Mrs. Arroyo, that you know, to, to Mrs. Royal's request of just to schedule it. And, and maybe this is a Mr. Green question, but don't we still have to complete part of our board retreat still? And maybe could this be a conversation on that to tackle two things? Or is that too soon? Or is that out of procedure or whatnot? Yeah, there's, there's no requirement that you do that. Um, that's more a matter of determining by the board when it wants to complete that process. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Matlock? I'll just 
throw this out there. I, I know, uh, Mr. Avadia, that we talked in committee about your suggestion about taking the discussion item off of strategic planning, um, but I'll just throw out there that maybe we should leave it on for the next action meeting, at least, um, since we don't have a report out um, since you did that this meeting, and leave that on as a discussion item for our next meeting, given the fact that everybody has children and work and schedules, um, uh, trying to get a separate meeting in a timely manner might, might prove difficult. And we do want everybody to be part of this discussion. So um, that I'll just throw that out there, that we leave that as a discussion item for our action agenda meeting um, and have the discussion, the discussion next meeting. That gives everybody the time from now until then, that's two weeks to, to give it some thought and pull their thoughts together. And I guess, let, let me ask Mrs. Neary, so how, what, what say you? I mean, we, we pushed it to you. I think you're the right person to lead that discussion. I like that, is, and we'll see. I think what'll be good to get an understanding is what we have on the agenda that evening, so that we're not shorting ourselves time on, on this discussion item and trying to balance that. To ensure we can dedicate time to this topic. Okay. Works for me. Right. Well, thank you all. Appreciate the feedback. Now, this is this, this is helpful. I mean, if nothing else, it'll give us something to do next month for strategic planning. So looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much. Yielding back. Thank you, Mr. Abadia. Okay, that brings us to our action agenda, move to curriculum and instruction, and I will turn it over to Ms. Matlack to move that agenda. Uh, superintendent recommends, and I move the following. One, approval of attendance at conferences and workshops for the 2020-2021 school year. Do I have a second? Mrs. Friedel, are there any questions? I don't see any hands, so no. I will turn it over to you, Mrs. Sugars, for the vote. I've opened up the online voting, so board members, you may cast your vote. And we have a unanimous yes vote. OK, thank you, Mrs. Sugars. OK, next we have business and facilities. And I'll turn that over to Mrs. Schultz to move that agenda. The superintendent recommends and I move the following. Number one, approval of bill list. Number two, resolution. Number three, approval of Cherry Hill McKinney Vento DCP and P students going out of district for the 2020 2021 school year. Do I have a second? Mrs. Matlack, are there any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. Okay, I have opened up the online voting. May cast your votes. Mrs. Sugars, I need to abstain to Beata Home Health on the bill list, please. Duly noted. And other than the exception noted by Mrs. Schultz, we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, great. Thank you, Mrs. Sugars. Next, we have the human resources agenda, and I will turn it back to Mrs. Schultz to move that agenda as well. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. The superintendent recommends, and I move the following. Number one, termination of employment certificated. Number two, termination of employment non-certificated. Number three, appointments certificated. Number four, appointments non-certificated. 
Number five, assignment salary change certificated. Number six, other compensation certificated. Number seven, other motions. Do I have a second? Mrs. Matlack, are there any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. I have opened up the online voting. You may cast your votes. And we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, great. Thank you, Mrs. Sugars. Okay, we do not have any items this evening for policy and legislation or strategic planning. So that will bring us to new business. Did we have any items for new business? Okay, if none, that would bring us to old business. Were there any items to discuss for old business this evening? Mr. Avadia has his hand up, Ms. Sneary. Oh, thank you. Mr. Avadia? So, so, so it's, it's a fairly regular topic, so I bring it up in new business versus old, but yeah, so, so Kim, Kim or Ms. Ms. Fredell makes a suggestion. I mean, what about coming back in person? And I don't necessarily know that it's right now that we do it, but like, should we set a, a, a goal, a, a timeline, a, a methodology, anything like that? So we're working towards something in terms of you know, in-person attendance. And I don't know if that means committee or full, I don't know, but you know, what, what do people think? I, I would just be curious. Okay, I open that up, Ms. Stratton. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad that Mr. Avadia brought it up um, because I, I'm not gonna lie and say that I haven't seen the comments from the community about us getting back to being in person. Um, and, and I'm, you know, here to represent the community. What I will share is that for me personally, I'm still not even at work full time yet. We're still just going back and I work for a large association that handles children every day. Every day. So I just wanna first add that. So that's why I operate with caution. Um, the other thing is, have we located a space to have that safely? Um, because that room, there's no way we would possibly be able to fit and be within the three feet the right way. Um, so if we could make sure we have those safety protocols in place for us and then still be able to live stream to the public. And then just on a personal note for me, my students have not even returned back to school. I'm, my sons have not returned back to school. And I um, would be I would feel very hypocritical if I'm choosing to go into the buildings when I'm also scared of them returning to the buildings. Not that I have any doubts that this, the administration isn't doing things safely, but I am saying on record, I'm a germaphobe who's still afraid. And I'm part of the 40% that still has a fear. So for me, um, you know, the whole flip side is I'm happy to ease back in with caution um, I will say that we are officially in the fourth wave of this mess, unfortunately. Um, and then I'll also add that vaccinations make a difference for me. So for someone like me, that's in the 40% of still doing things remotely in our district, um, I would feel much more comfortable if at the very least we said, um, or, or would be understanding to a board member saying, I, I'm comfortable return once I'm fully vaccinated or you know, after I'm, I'm fully vaccinated and had my 14 days to know that it's working. Um, not something that's just an immediate thing, but I, I, I would love to go back. I just wanted to voice that because I don't want people to think that you know, working from home is a choice at this point. <laughs> it is definitely not. And I will say um, all of the feelings and the sentiments that some of our, our community has shared about how difficult this is, it, it doesn't just end with you. I'm at the same boat and I'm sure some of my other fellow board member colleagues are. So this is not something we want to do. It's something that we're working through and, and having to make sure that we are moving on with life in spite of. So I, I, I would be willing to do it. Like I said, for me personally, I would wanna be fully vaccinated first. And then I also would want it to be at a space that is a little bit more com accommodating to our current new standards, to quite honest. Thank you, Mrs. Stratton, for your very open and candid feedback. I appreciate it. 
Okay, Mrs. Tong. Oh, you're muted, Ms. Tong. There we go. Okay, I just want to talk about the um, I know the young, the kindergarten to the fifth, the elementary school. These kids really need a lot of um, in-person uh, interactions. Um, I know I don't know all the um, you know the the part of things. How, why how we can put, get our kids, these young kids to classroom so that it's a five days for the parents. It, it will help them a lot. The middle and the high school kids they can pretty much can go in between. If we can get the elementary school five days a week, I think the parents will be very happy. And I have young kids before I will, I know how painful it is have them be around you when you need a break. So let's see how we can help these parents out. Oh, that's all I have to say. I feel very painful for them. Uh, but hopefully we can make this work before the end of this, even for a couple of weeks down the road. Thank and how you. do you feel, Mrs. Tong, about um, returning to or putting forth a plan to return to in-person board meetings? Uh, repeat the question again, Ms. Terry. How do you feel about the board returning to in-person meetings? And um, Yeah, if we have to, we, we can get back. If everybody's happy and all good to go, then... I'm okay with that too. Okay, thank you. No problem. Ms. Arorio? Um, I'm actually in the same boat as um, Corinne. Um, but again, if there were accommodations made to space wise and everything, um, I would see about that. But I also, um, we're, then by, I, I would have to make a lot of other accommodations on a, on a personal level, just to even be a, make my circle larger. Um, but if there's conversation, scheduling, timeline, time frame, I could figure that out. Like I don't have just to know that there is a conversation happening. Um, and yes, both my children are still home. Um, and if, and after we're, done this piece of the conversation to just go back to see um, and talk about what Ms. Tong just brought up about the elementary piece. Cause I, you know, I think we're gonna be focusing on that, right? On uh, in our on our return to learn committees. Um, and hopefully we have a presentation on what that option would look like to have that our, our elementary school level um, change up if that's a possibility. Okay, thank you, Ms. Arorio. Was there anyone else? Ms. Matlack and then Ms. Friedel. You know, uh, I think it's good that we talk about, you know, when we are all going to come back, um, you know, and that, you know, uh, you know, that we are, are mindful and cognizant of, you know, board members and their families that have, a variety of, of concerns or issues or situations that they that they have to deal with. And everybody has their own personal level of comfort that has, you know, very valid um, uh, reasons for, for, for being at that level of comfort. Um, and we have to be respectful of that. Um, I think, uh, Part of this, uh, we've opened our board meetings to any board member who wants to come in person. And um, I, I, I think right now it, it, it's telling how many of us have come into the building, um, you know, to, to have the meetings. And I suspect that, you know, as um, Mrs. Elmer Stratton said, and Mrs. Arroyo said, you know, that, um, you know, once, once they're vaccinated, um, fully vaccinated, that that will change. I suspect, you know, that there may be other board members who feel that way as well, and we may see more board members. But I do think that we we need to have something a little more specific that that we're going to work towards. Also, keeping in mind that we're in the mid, we are still in this pandemic, and there are still people at risk, and um, whether that's us personally 
or somebody's family members or somebody that they care for. Um, you know, so, but we do need to have, um, I think something that will work for. So you know, perhaps we should be talking about, um, a, you know, a, a date, um, even if that's just a general date of this summer or the fall. Not, I'm not talking about a specific board meeting, um, you know, but, you know, we still have the board meetings opened up for board members as they, as their comfort level reaches it to come into the board, me board meeting. And I would suspect that Dr. Malash and Mrs. Sugars, um, you know, have ideas of how to accommodate more of us that, that come into the building um, for a meeting. And, um, you know, and when they're prepared, I won't put them on the spot and ask them for those plans right now, um, but they, you know, they can share them with us, but I'm sure that, that they've thought about that if more of us come in. Just my thoughts. Read. Thank you, Ms. Matlack. I guess for myself, I, I would also question um, to Mr. Green what the requirements are to accommodating the space for the public to attend in person as well. And factoring that in, is there a certain level, you know, is it when you have board majority in person, how, how does that look? Where does it need to be? Um, to Mrs. Stratton's um, sentiments, not everybody is back in work either. If it were a situation where we were mandating and saying students had to be in person and there is no remote and um, what does that look like? I, I could see the concern and you're saying that and yet you are remote, um, keeping in mind that many um, local government is also still at handling their meetings um, remote and we want everyone to be safe I, you know, I want to be mindful of all the board members and thinking about the community sentiment as Ms. Stratton mentioned. Um, I am mindful of that and, uh, you know, how they feel. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, it is a volunteer position and I want to be mindful of those giving up their time to ensure that we're doing this and, and that they're there and that they feel safe. Um, you know, I, it's, it's split in my house. <laughs> I have, you know, two going in person, not necessarily willing, um, and, and two that are remote and, and, you know, and being mindful that I have two that are immunocompromised as well that I, I, I have to think about when uh, making that decision. I too am not back in the office either, and I don't have a definitive date when that will look like um, I also agree with Ms. Stratton, my comfort level will go up once I am fully vaccinated. However, that seems to remain being a moving target um, based on what we're seeing. So I, I do wanna be respectful of my colleagues on the board and their thoughts and to Mrs. Matlack's point, and it is open for anyone that feels comfortable to attend in person, they can. But we do have to then consider where we are, are holding the meeting and how the public can attend in person. So I would look to Mr. Green for that input as well. Sure. Um, uh, one, once you hold a quorum of the board at a meeting, so that you're physically holding the meeting at a, at a location, um, you then must admit the public to the meeting. Uh, and um, while we certainly uh, would space everyone out, um, we technically are not covered by the executive order um, that limits the scope of uh, in indoor meetings. So in theory, uh, you really would have to admit as much of the public as you can with spacing people out to a location, which means it won't be in this room. Um, you will have to have it in maybe one of the high school auditoriums at a cafeteria, you know, some large space, you know, the multi-purpose room here uh, that you can have everybody spaced out who's pre uh, presently attending by the board as well as the public. Um, you still might have to put limits on how many people can come in um, because you just may not be able, if it's a large crowd, to get everybody in and safely space them. Now, of course, this will all change, you know, once the public health emergency ends, but for the foreseeable future now, uh, that's what we're going to have to do. So we have to factor all that in if you do plan to come back uh, in some kind of hybrid fashion uh, so that, that the planning has to occur in an orderly fashion. Um, this is you, know, you raise valid points in terms of the balance between the volunteers, whether people have been vaccinated or not yet, uh, individual health concerns that people may have, all, all issues that certainly you know need to be thought through. 
So you need to do this in an orderly and planned fashion. Uh, I do think the idea of setting some kind of a, a rough target is, is a good idea. Like, are we talking about maybe September? Let's use that as our, our goal um, and plan accordingly and, and then develop it from there. Um, but, but you are going to have to be able to have the public come in. Um, I will say that my experience has been that many of the boards that are doing this, um, the public is very happy attending remotely. Um, they, you know, they have a lot of empty chairs, frankly, um, out there in the, in the space. Um, because it's just much more convenient for the public to be able to watch remotely and comment remotely. Um, having said that, if you do a full, you're not required to do a, a remote meeting. You, you can have a full physical meeting, um, in which case you do not have to do the uh, public participation remotely. Then um, you are free to basically just say, if you want to comment, you do have to attend the meeting, uh, if you will, the old style meetings that we had. So those are, that's another option. Uh, in terms of that, but that's something that's probably not going to happen for most boards until after the public health emergency ends. Okay, thank you. And I would say that to, to Ms. Matlack's point and, and Mrs. Schultz had comment as well, that um, it, it, it could target for the summer and obviously by September, especially if we get to a point where you're saying all students have to be in person. Um, and Mrs. Schultz? Yeah, I was just going to have, I think, Paul, you, you may have clarified, um, but if we, if we have five board members that do come in, if I understood correctly, then we would have to open the board. I, I don't want to say we have to, but then, then our meeting then becomes open to the pub, public for attendance. Yeah. Did I understand yeah. that correctly? Yeah. Yes. So, so that might, okay, because the way like that we're doing it now is, you know, it, our board meetings, um, are open to any member that wants to come, but that might be problematic only in the sense that if we just happen to email and say, hey, I'm going to come, I'm going to attend live, then we could run into a situation of where we, we just by mistake have five members that attend and we haven't let the public know that they could attend that meeting that night in person. Um, so right. I just, we'd have to really be planning in advance versus what you're suggesting, Paul, which is it might make more sense to target a date so that we could be we could plan for it, the space more appropriately. Um, that, that's just where I could see we might run into a little bit of trouble if we just, you know, kind of go about the, what we're doing now. Whereas, hey, if you want to come, you're certainly welcome to. But I could see us potentially having five board members at a meeting and then not letting the public know in advance. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. And then the only other piece I wanted to ask, Paul, was did you see, was there, is there a problem or would it be problematic if we, not to, to move off of board meetings, but with committee meetings, the recommendation that um, Mrs. Friedel had made at our BNF meeting was to have at least one, one chair or one person from, you know, the um, meeting attend in person with um, Dr. Malosh and Mrs. Sugars in the room live stream it to the other committee members who may not be comfortable yet attending live and then opening that up to the public. Is that an option? Is that something that we could do so that we could allow community members to, to re-attend committee meetings? Yes, that's an option. The uh, committee meetings, as long as you don't have a quorum of the board present, are not covered by the Open Public Meetings Act. So you're not required to advertise them. You're not required to admit the public. But by the same token, you can do that voluntarily. Nothing stops you from doing that. So you could do that in a hybrid okay. fashion as you're talking about. There's nothing, nothing that stops you from doing that. Okay, thank you. For a quick question, Mr. Green, could you not also do it in the same platform as we are doing it now yes. within Zoom? That allows for that comment. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're free to do it any, any manner you wish to. So can okay. I just... Can I just say when I made the suggestion, I, I wasn't um, I wasn't suggesting it being on a live Zoom platform for everybody to watch because that would open it up for the other members of the board to be okay uh, watching. Right. So the thought process was it would be a link just for the committee members, and public could come in to the room with whichever committee member was there um, live, and that would keep that quorum issue. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I, sorry, um, Kim, that's a, I'm sorry, Ms. Friedel, that's an excellent clarification that 
yeah, we, we, we had said the link would just go out to just the committee meeting so that we would avoid the quorum issue, but then it would also allow for if members of the public wanted to attend, we could then have the members of the public um, uh, uh, attend. Um, so I think that would just be a matter of was there is, you know, do we have a member on every committee that felt comfortable? Um, and I think we kind of went through it through the various committees. And I think we landed on that there was a member that sat on every committee meeting that was comfortable being um, feel, coming coming in person. Did we? Ha okay, I, that would be my only why because I would wonder then for CNI and what I wouldn't want is some committees to be open and then others not. Um, well, your personnel. Committee I believe be Mayor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's that's going to be a closed committee for the human resources. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, yep. And I believe Miss. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Paul. Uh, no, I'm sorry. And I think Mr. 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 point that uh, you know you want to be very careful that you don't have a quorum of the board participating in a committee meeting. Uh, that's not to say they couldn't watch a live stream of it because they wouldn't be participating as board members. They would just be observing it like the rest of the public. As an attendee, not a panelist. So you right. could do that then. Right, but they'd have to be very careful not to comment or not to right. you know, join in that meeting in any fashion. Okay. Um, I believe Ms. Stratton had her hand up and then Ms. Matlack. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, you know, first just add again that like my comments are strictly for my personal comfort levels, right? Because I just I don't want anybody to walk away from tonight and think like automatically I'm on either any side because there's no side besides the side of what's best for our students and our staff. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and and again, just you know, we have that we we're giving the option to our families right now to do what's best for their comfort level. And I think it's only fair to have that same option extended to us um, as board members, but I am 100% okay with us saying we have a target date that we need to move to because obviously being in person is part of the position, right? Or you know, attending these meetings is a part of the position. But I just wanted that to be very clear that I, you know, I, I understand everybody needs to get back to school. Ms. Tong brought it up. Everybody wants their ch children back in. Um, you know, but I just don't want us to be a board that forces one thing for one set of, uh, you know, audience and then gives enough, says another thing to another audience. We're included in that as community members and as parents and whatnot. So I just wanted that cl clarified. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Ms. Matlack? Well, Mrs. Neary, I just wanted to ask if you, if then you wanted um, committee chairs to find out if there's one or more of their committee members who are willing to, to be there because, um, you know, as the chair of CNI, we didn't discuss this or, or know about this. Um, so is that, are you asking the committee chairs to? I, yeah, I think we out, should. Or are you gonna poll the whole board? Well, I think I want it wasn't, you're right. It wasn't discussed at committee. Um, so I don't know if this was new or old business on each committee agenda. Um, to bring it up for discussion because I know we've brought it up in the past as the full board. Um, I mentioned that just now because there are committees, but I did when it I CNI came to mind because I don't know that there is someone from CNI that would go in person um, to open that up unless you know in administration counts. But I want to be fair. Um, I think it just makes most sense now to to poll the board. But my sense is in conversing as the board, it, we're still not 100% on having everybody back in person. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go ahead and put that, that poll out to the board now. And, and I wanna be mindful thinking about staff as well, right? Like we're sitting here and we, you know, we, we are here to represent the children because they don't have a voice, but I wanna be mindful of, of everyone. Um, and knowing, you know, for some that you can't go back into the office until you're vaccinated. So um, I just, I want to be mindful of all that. So I'm happy to pull the board now and to just go around the, the room or the virtual room um, to see, you know, it, one, are you, you know, it doesn't sound like uh, we have at least five that want to go back now. Is it comfortable for a conversation 
to converse again at the summer in prep for September. Following that, as Ms. Stratton said, it's now the fourth wave or the fifth wave or whatever it looks like. Um, so I'll start with Mr. Avadia. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so for me, I mean, I, I think working towards September um, sounds, like, sounds like a good idea. You know, it, it could, I mean, if there was a strong, fit. and I think the, the other thing is, you know, our, we, we go into a less, I guess for me, I, I'm, I'm kind of okay with what, whatever. For my committee, I'm happy to come in and represent. I'm on two committees. If PNL needs a designee and that's a value, I'm happy to come in for that as well. You know, I, I mean, I'm in. Um, I would be happy to not come in if I was a fifth, if that created a legal issue. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of okay with anything. I, I just think it's a, a fair topic and uh, I think it's been a good discussion, but I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, you know, I'm up for, look, it is a volunteer job. It is, you know, despite all the adoration that I receive on a daily basis, <laughs> um, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's complicated, but it's, it's good work that we must do. I'm happy to be involved in any way. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't want to push past September unless we really felt as a board, look, we, we just can't make September work. Um, but if, if it was September and we had a plan, I, I think just having the plan would be the right direction. That's that's my thought. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Robati. And Ms. Matlack? Yeah, I think I think I think September is a good a good date to to aim for, um, you know. And if we're coming, if if we're aiming for that, then it make makes sense to also uh, do the committee meetings, at, you know, at the same time. You know, we'll be bringing all of the kids back. Um, hopefully, all of us, all all adults, will be back, be able to have been vaccinated by then. Um, and, you know, everybody's comfort level, um, you know, has, is, is certainly individual, but um, it gives us time to prepare and to, to work towards doing that as we bring the kids back. So as Mr. Avadi said, suggesting September, um, you know, I think that's a good, good time to aim for. And I would uh, make the suggestion of the committee meetings for that to be the goal as well. Okay, thank you, Ms. Matlack. Ms. Schultz? Yeah, I, I think I like, I would agree with my fellow peers, the September date, um, I think having a goal and a date makes, makes sense. Um, and I would also support um, the, the structure that we talked about at, at BNF. Um, I'm happy to come in um, and attend live as well. I think that's a, it's, Good to kind of open committee meetings back up to the public. So I would support both. Great. Thank you, Ms. Schultz. Ms. Friedel? Um, I, I'm going to just concur with what uh, Ms. Schultz said, September and, and the committee meetings. Um, if we're able to, um, you know, have a member attend um, and open them, uh, I'm supportive of that. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Aurorio? Um, same. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Tom? And why has my mouse? You're muted, Ms. Tom. Oh. Yes, it's still showing muted. Can I, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I am in all favor for September. Okay, thank you. Ms. Stratton? Yes, agree to September. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement as well and I, I agree with opening the committees back up if we can make that possible, whether it be um, on the platform or if someone is there in person. I would just note then for those that want to attend in person for the full board that we continue to notify so that we can ensure that you're you're not hitting the five and um, we don't then have a quorum that we've not planned for. 
Okay. Um, was there any other old business? Okay. Uh, there's no other old business. Dr. Malash, did you want to do superintendent comments or did you want to do the uh, second public comment? Because I didn't see the superintendent comments on here. Yep. No, uh, typically superintendent comments are, this, are during the action meeting. Um, and it comes after the students do their report out. So I would just go into public comment. And then if you want, if there's anything I can address after public comment, I'll do that piece. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So then that brings us to the second public comment, uh, which is open for any topic. And again, I just ask you state your full name and address. And I will turn it over. And as usual, we will start with those on the line. And then once we have moved through everyone, we will turn it over to the written submissions. And first we have Alana Yaris. Alana Yaris, Six Gately Court. I just wanted to speak to the board about your calendar discussion that you had, being that Easter and Passover are several weeks apart in the 2023-2024 school year, I think. Um, I went back and looked at a calendar to maybe help you. The last time this happened was in 2016. I'm sure you still have the calendar from 2015, 2016. Maybe you should look and see what you did for spring break then. Before that was 2008, so maybe 2007, 2008 calendar, as well as, a, as in 2005, so the 2004, 2005 calendar. Um, I know that it will happen again in a couple of years, so always good to look at what was done in the past. If that worked, maybe do it again. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sierras. Next, we have Rick Short. Hello, Rick Short, 1002 Shelton Parkway. Uh, drop again about the uh, return to learn. Um, what I find interesting is that um, most of the uh, other districts across New Jersey, places like Patterson and Newark and um, even Lakewood, all have been doing temporary improvements with ventilation equipment. Uh, even Woodbury, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. So we, so the cases are increasing a little bit and we're not doing anything to improve our ventilation. Second up, also there's nothing ever being done with testing. So all these things would help us with return to learn. I'm all for a five day a week on the same status that we're doing half days because I feel that once you keep lunch out of the uh, equation, you reduce the odds of spread. And you can see this all across America, that once you involve a lunch, you kind of put odd, you, you kind of increase odds of uh, spread. So I ask again that we go to five day a week, half day for the rest of the year, reevaluate over the summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Short. Okay, next we have Y. Yarez. And full name and address, please. Uh, Yoni Yarez, Six Gately Court. I'm just gonna piggyback off of Alana's comment. Um, I think we'd be going against our district's principles of being caring about social justice and equity if we were just smack dab and follow what college campuses. Higher education is not a leader when it comes to spring break at all. In fact, it's one of the greatest areas of concerns when it comes to social justice and equity. Uh, so picking a random week hurts a lot of students. Um, it's already challenging for Jewish students who then have to take off for the two days at the beginning and the two days at end. Then Easter, you'd have those who observe for Good Friday and also Easter Monday also taking off. So I think it would be creating a bigger problem. Not to mention when you get to the staff question for it as well. Um, I think this would be an interesting discussion to bring to the CPECE, so the Cultural Person Equity and Character Education Committee, um, to discuss how we can bring in, I think Ms. Verdell has brought up, how do we bring up more days off uh, the cover as our district has gotten more diverse. So I think it'd be important to kick this conversation over to them to discuss what are our demographics right now? What should we be doing to adjust? I think the district has done a great job of covering Easter and Passover. I think we'd be taking a step backwards um, by ignoring that now. 
um, especially when it only happens based on the Jewish calendar once seven times out of 17 years. Um, so it's not even majority of a situation uh, to be going on to make a vast change to how it's was operated. Um, and I think, and I also just want to say the renaming of the administrative building is a wonderful uh, thing to be doing. And we look forward to the board and the administration looking at other opportunities to honor Cherry Hill. Um, and it'd be nice at some point to do more oral history. Our community does have some older members who are moving on and, out, and just to capture some of that history so that at some point students that are going through can do more with Cherry Hill history. I think it's been a long time since Cherry Hill history has been included in our curriculum. Um, we've got a very diverse community, diverse history that we should be doing learning more about with some incredible leaders across all the community from present and to the past. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yaris. Okay, and next we have Nick Bevid. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick Bevid, 1213 Cropo Road. Uh, the purpose of my comment is to express concern that I have regarding a book that my first grader received through the PTA's Read Across America initiative. Let me be clear, I fully support our school's PTA and the Read Across America agenda. However, my son received Hands Up by Brianna McDaniel. The story itself, very sweet, very nice, but on the last page, you see a character holding a Black Lives Matter sign. Furthermore, when you read some of the various comments about the book by third parties, you see sentences like, as an introduction to children to social activism, this book will serve well. This is a political message that does not belong in an, amount, in an elementary school. I do not send my children to school for them to become social activists. They are there to learn how to read, write, and do arithmetic. They also know that the PTA decided to not have dine and donate events at Chick-fil-A because it would be too controversial. I'm also pretty confident that the district would not approve a children's MAGA book or a pro-life for kids book for distribution, and it shouldn't. What's more concerning is that I found out that many of these books were chosen from teachers' wish lists and approved by district personnel. Political messaging of any kind should be very clearly absent from an elementary school's curriculum. School districts and the teachers within them must stick to teaching our youth and the parents should be left to raising their kids. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bevard. Okay. Okay, Mrs. Sh oh, it looks like we have Laura Einhorn. Good evening, Laura. Ann Einhorn, 1017 Edgemore Road. I, I was very much fascinated by your discussion about opening up the board meetings. Um, in my humble opinion, there's a certain amount of space in the Malberg administration building that you could have social distancing. Um, I think pretty effectively for the board members that are comfortable coming. I, I think we're at a point where it's, it, 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 why don't you just do a trial and see what happens and ask that the public sign up so that you can do the appropriate spacing. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank all the educators and staff members in our building who've been going in full time um, and acknowledge the work that they have been doing for our students, whether it be four days or three days or five days. Um, they're putting themselves out there for our students and our community. And even though I don't have children in the system anymore, I would like you to know that I appreciate what you're doing. It also helps, of course, that I have several educators in my own personal family. The other thing I absolutely delighted to see on your agenda this evening was the discussion of renaming the Malberg Administration Building. Um, I adored Mr. Art Lewis. He taught me many things. He showed me many things. I learned many things from Mr. Lewis and his family. And thank you for considering and doing this for his family. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seinhorn. Okay, I will now turn it to Mrs. Sugars for the submitted comments. Uh, I only have uh, one comment uh, from Dr. Jeff Potowitz. I'm gonna put the timer on because it's very lengthy. New Jersey Senate Bill 3488 has quickly passed the New Jersey Senate. Bigger is supposed to be better. There is supposed to be economy of scale. I have compared our school district to the Chesterfield pre-K to sixth grade school district. Please do the same. 
Google search for SFRA district profile, click on the link to the Education Law Center, look and click on the graphs, compare our graphs to Chesterfield and Northern Burlington Regional School District, the 7th to 12th grade district that Chesterfield School District sends its students to. From the article about Chesterfield School District I have mentioned before, entitled The Perfect Suburban School is Living a Financial Nightmare, Here's who to blame. Take a walk down Thorn Lane, past the new houses with swimming pools and three car garages, and you would think you had arrived at the picture perfect neighborhood elementary school. I have enclosed in the PDF pictures and a short narrative from the architect's website about that picture perfect school. It is a preschool to sixth grade school with a capacity of 900 plus students. Total square feet is 115,000 plus. Numbers are approximate. Construction cost was noted to be 25.9 million. Compare this to the cost estimate for a completed Kingston Elementary School of 51,000 plus square feet with 420 students. The construction cost was noted to be 25.4 million. True, the Chesterfield, the school in Chesterfield was finished, I believe, in 2011. But in our district, because we would have a number of projects going on at the same time, there should be economies of scale. Bigger is supposed to be better. I mentioned before that our total equalized school rate without debt is about 10% higher than the total equalized school district's tax rate without debt for the Chesterfield community. Even with significantly more commercial properties, our equalized tax rate is still higher than Chesterfield. Under SFRA, direct state aid to education was supposed to follow at-risk students in whatever school district they attended, but both those school districts have a smaller percentage of at-risk students than Cherry Hill does. Chesterfield has a significantly smaller percentage. Both these school districts get significantly more direct state aid to education per pupil, two to three times the amount per pupil than we receive. Leaders in Chesterfield felt, and I still believe their community is, was being cheated by the state. Read online the strongly worded article I mentioned. Most of the state was sympathetic. We in Cherry Hill have been cheated for 30 plus years, like other middle class cities before us. No one cared. Leadership helped us. And that's the end. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Sugars. Okay, Dr. Malash, was there anything you wanted to address? It, the, there's just a, a couple. Um, uh, in, in terms of the calendar, uh, the last time that we ran into the situation in 2016, the district spring break occurred uh, the week before Easter. Um, I would say that the, the board in Cherry Hill, as we've done calendars over the last number of years, uh, called Christmas Equity and Character has certainly been uh, can, you know, contained uh, with a voice in the decisions that were made about how the calendar was going to be constructed, uh, which has brought us to you know, the recognition of Diwali and Lunar New Year uh, through King's Day. Um, we'll be closed for, uh, I think it's in, in June of 2008. 23 that will be closed for um, uh, Juneteenth, uh, that third Friday in June. Uh, so acknowledging you know the, the different holidays when they occur, uh, constructing the calendar after the discussion and the board members were correct, it was, it was a robust discussion about calendar. Um, and rather than doing a full week off, you know, and, and doing it around um, the Easter holiday and the Passover holiday, uh, you know, provided opportunity um, and recognition, you know, which is, is so uh, important. Um, I think that's all based on the comments. Uh, again, as, Ms., as Dr. Mahan talked about in uh, her presentation, uh, the presentation earlier in the meeting, uh, our return to learn committees meet next Tuesday. All three of them meet on Tuesday. Um, so I expect there will be great discussion during those committee meetings. Uh, tomorrow we'll start advertising or reminding people about the time uh, the town hall meeting, which is scheduled for Monday evening, the 19th of April. Again, we published those dates back in December. Uh, so we'll be sending out the reminders and the Zoom link, uh, ways to submit questions ahead of time. We'll be announcing the panelists um, in the week or beginning of next week. Uh, we're looking forward to the discussion and that will focus on return to learn. Um, Dr. Mann addressed it earlier. Mr. Ravadia asked the question uh, and certainly we'll be able to talk, talk as much as we can about what's going on right now. Uh, and what's going to go on and what our plans are for September uh, of 2021. And again, to reiterate what's in the presentation that Dr. Mahan delivered, um, the plan is 
uh, that we're going to be open five full days of school, lunch, um, you know, uh, regular, in quotes, regular school uh, as we again transition back into a more typical schedule. Uh, and we are still uh, waiting to hear what the Department of Ed and the state says about remote options uh, for children. So that's where we're at. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Malash. Uh, we do not have anything this evening for a second executive session. So that brings us to the end of our board meeting. And I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mrs. Schultz. All in favor? Okay, great. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, you too. Night. Night. Night.